Matrimino, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that there are many other people who have contributed to um, the information and research that I'm going to present today, and I'll try to remember to acknowledge them as I go along. Um, in the next 30 minutes, I'm hoping to just give an overview of what I see as the major problems and opportunities for conservation and especially restoration of big sagebrush in the Great Basin. Now I'll focus specifically on four projects that are either directly or indirectly supported by the Great Basin LCC. I won't have time to go into much detail on each, so this will be kind of an overview. So big sagebrush, as many of you know, is one of the most widespread species in America. And it has typically occupied areas that were um, relatively undisturbed, aside from um, the grazing influences. But that's changing rapidly because of fire, invasives, and rapid climate change. And this is a problem because big sagebrush is considered a foundation species. It's a very unique physical presence and chemical, biochemical attributes cause it to strongly influence the surrounding biota, including plants, animals, and, and uh, insects. And this is most notorious for dependent species like say, greater sage grouse. So the climate shifts in this region are particularly significant. I want to talk a little bit about those. Um, over the last 20 years here in Boise, we've seen about a degree of half and a half of increase in minimum temperatures. And those types of climate changes are predicted to have an impact on big sagebrush. In the left panel, you see the current distribution of big sagebrush. And if you correlate that distribution with climate, you can generate a um, species distribution model that can be then projected on top of future temperature cha changes that are predicted for the region to give us a rendering of how sagebrush distributions might change in the future. And in the right-hand panel, you can see in red the areas that are predicted to have contraction of big sagebrush. And in blue, you see the expansion areas. And you're probably noticing that there's a lot more red area than there is blue. And that's a concern, both for conservation as well as for restoration uh, planning and investment. One thing about these simplified species distribution models is that they've tended to assume um, homogeneity in a number of ways. One way is that they don't really consider the remarkable, remarkable diversity that exists in big sagebrush. So big sagebrush does not occupy such a wide range and many different elevations by having one super genotype. Instead, it has a very high intraspecific diversity. And my colleague Bryce Richardson at the uh, US Forest Service has, um, has got me into a really um, excellent line of research exploring that, that intraspecific diversity. And so to begin, there's three different subspecies of big sagebrush. At the highest elevations, we've got mountain big sagebrush. It likes some snowy areas. And it also is considered highly palatable to wildlife. At lower elevations, we have basin big sagebrush, which grows very large and is very fecund, but is considered not um, palatable to many wildlife um, species. And then there's Wyoming big sagebrush, which is depicted here in these two uh, species distribution models. Um, Wyoming big sagebrush is where most of our problems of fire and invasions occur, and so it's useful to separate its climate responses from the other subspecies. Here you can see the lighter colors show areas that are considered to be less suitable, both in, um, under current climate conditions as well as projected out um, 40 years from now. And you can see that when we distinguish Wyoming big sagebrush separate from the other subspecies, there's a lot more contraction. So this intraspecific inter diversity in big sagebrush does matter. And there's two other additional levels of diversity that I want to mention. So in addition to different subspecies, there's different cytotypes that, that um, vary in being either um, diploid or tetraploid. In other words, a doubling of the genome. And those cytotype differences also have very strong effects on how the 
big sagebrush type response to climate, and so they're relevant. They also affect um, growth strategies and things like that that are really significant for restoration. And then finally, um, at the most resolute level, um, there's high population level variability within a subspecies or cytotype. And it makes sense because in order to occupy so many different climates, um, sagebrush has had to become locally adapted. And that occurs at the population level. And that is a big, um, very important factor for management of big sagebrush, considering the types of problems at hand. One of the most significant problems is that fires are not only changing in terms of the regime, they're also becoming much larger when they do occur. Um, and when fires become larger, we're seeing emergent issues, such as the occurrence of significant catastrophic wind erosion, which is very important for big sagebrush. When we have very large fires that are 300, thousand acres, sometimes a million acres in size, like in 2012, um, there may not be any local seed sources. And so determining appropriate seed sources and finding the seeds um, is increasingly a problem. And then moreover, sagebrush um, does not re-sprout, and its seeds are not viable very long in soil, usually only up to three years. And then furthermore, it's thought to have very short uh, dispersal distances, only on the order of like a meter or so. And then lastly, um, research by Dave Pike and others show that sagebrush seeds don't like to be buried. So if they're in soils that are being redistributed, that's a problem. All of these things factor together to motivate sagebrush seeding efforts. And additionally, there's lots of efforts to plant sagebrush seedlings on the landscapes. And that, that's what I'm going to focus on today. One of the other main challenges is related to changing seedbed conditions. So things like erosion are problems, but there are dramatic changes in the types of plants, types of herbs, that sagebrush must interact with when it's trying to establish on our landscapes. These left two photos here show um, what is considered to be a normal type of fire regime. Big sagebrush burns. It burns hot because there's wood. Um, there's, on the lower left-hand panel, you can see lots of bare soil um, and the presence of old shrub microsites with relatively fertile, dark soil. Um, those microsites, um, we think, could be hot spots for the regeneration of native perennials. But as most of you know, cheatgrass is also relatively competitive in this post-fire environment. And um, if you go to the upper right-hand uh, photograph, you can see a landscape that has lost all of its structure and has become dominated by a mix of cheatgrass, and in this case, I think there's some Sandberg's bluegrass in there. This is from southern Idaho. Um, as you know, these annual grasses increase wildfire fuels, they increase the fire return interval, and they propagate the spread of larger fires, we think. When they burn, the lower left-hand uh, photograph shows that the burn environment is quite different. Um, in this case, we've got a dirty burn with lots of litter, not a lot of um, bare soil microsites for sagebrush to establish in. And then furthermore, we can expect that cheatgrass is going to um, reestablish very quickly and provide competitive pressure for any perennials like big sagebrush that might be trying to reestablish. And often, we try to um, seed in species like crested wheatgrass to break this cycle. Crested wheatgrass, as well as other um, herbs, um, might provide some competitive pressure onto any sagebrush that we're trying to establish on the landscapes. So there's a, a number of ways that um, cheatgrass and the fire cycle are affecting big sagebrush. And the bottom line is um, restoration efforts are needed. The, um, the challenge is and the unfortunate news is that um, sagebrush seeding and planting is not easy, particularly in the lower elevations that are drier where Wyoming big sagebrush normally occurs. Here's a set of graphs from um, the Knudsen Pike et al. chronosequence study that was published last year. The left two panels show aerial seeding effects over something like 100 um, historic seedings that occurred over about a decade, about two decades 
and were sampled um, in the last five years. And then the right to panels show um, the outcomes of sagebrush seed that was put into the ground by a rangeland drill pulled behind a tractor using farming implements. And the overall message from these is that sagebrush recovery, um, when one goes out and samples treatments uh, randomly, sagebrush recovery is not very good. BS means burned and seeded, BX is burned and unseeded, and UX is unburned and unseeded. So these are basically your control plots shown here. I'm hoping you can see my cursor. Um, and this lower left-hand panel again shows that the, the seeding success is not good and, and regeneration in general is decreasing um, as sites get hotter. All later show that there are successful seeding and planting treatments out there and there's actually a lot that we can learn from them. The key thing is trying to learn from successes so that we can improve the likelihood of restoration improvements and on this topic, um, for me personally, the cup is half full. I believe that there's a lot of opportunity to improve um, our restoration techniques and restore habitat. So I want to talk about opportunities. Um, I want to briefly mention that there's interest both in dispersing sagebrush seeds across vast landscapes burn landscapes, sometimes we would see areas, the BLM might see areas that are uh, tens of thousands of acres in size. And they do this by filling up a hel helicopter bin with seed and uh, distributing the seeds, sometimes on snow, usually in the winter, um, on the freshly burned landscape. Alternatively, um, seedlings can be propagated in a nursery and outplanted. The advantage there is that we can circumvent all of those constraints to um, seed germination and initial survival, survival. Initial survival of seedlings is a very important demographic bottleneck for big sagebrush and therefore for restoration. Um, before I talk about our research at USGS, I want to point towards what can be learned from reclamation sites. So traditionally, sagebrush re, uh, rehabilitation onto um, abandoned mined sites has been more successful. Those sites are smaller. They tend to have uh, better funding. And then furthermore, those sites, those reclamation sites often have um, programs in which multiple inter restoration interventions can be used to try to bring the plant community back to a desired or acceptable condition. Yeah, without seeding, um, a recent publication shows that sagebrush might take almost 100 years, 87 years to be exact, to recover. That's shown here in this scatter plot published by Avermet et al. Um, recovery index of one indicates that you've got recovery. Um, here you've got a, a lot of unexplained variability, but generally speaking, the message is that in Wyoming, um, Sagebrush recovery takes a long time, and we should um, let also similarly have a, a long time scale in our view of sagebrush restoration and, and rehabilitation in the Great Basin. One of the most interesting things that can be learned from reclamation seedings is how all the other things that are done in a restoration project affect a species like big sagebrush that has been seeded or planted. So, for example, one of the uh, things that have, has been evaluated the most is the effect of co-seeding herbs or other treatments to herbs. Um, here's another very recent paper that came out last month that shows us that um, seeding grasses and forbs decreases the number of shrubs that have recovered on reclamation sites over um, the time scale of decades. And these data are from eastern Montana, which has a lot more summer moisture and therefore presumably a lot lusher herb growth. But a big question is how much can these sorts of ideas be transferred into the Great Basin where our re post-fire rehabilitation treatments and other restoration efforts almost never um, focus just on sagebrush but usually have a variety of treatments of the herb layer. 
So now I'm going to talk about um, LCDC supported research that we've been doing that addresses these questions. Here's the sagebrush seedling. As you can see, it's surrounded by lots of um, live and senesced um, herbs, specifically grasses. I'll present two studies that were done at landscape scales and two that were done at larger eco-regional scales. Um, the first will involve seedlings and the latter two will be on seeds. And I'd like to acknowledge here in writing um, co-funders and collaborators. There are many who aren't listed and I'm very, very appreciative of all their contributions. So the first study um, was funded specifically by the LCC um, and has recently or is actually undergoing publication right now. This is available, I think, online first in rangeland ecology and management. Here's a study in which we evaluated the effects of herbicide, which is commonly done to reduce annual grass competition for species that have been seeded or planted onto a site, usually before they're seeded or planted. Mowing, which is often done to reduce the litter that might inhibit the penetration of herbicide to the soil surface. Or mowing is sometimes also done to reduce um, fuels. Whole community seeding, and by that I mean seeding sagebrush as well as perennial grasses and forbs. And then finally, um, selection of sagebrush seed sources, which is something that I've done a, quite a bit of research on with my colleagues here in Idaho, and I'm, I'm only going to describe our work in a, in a very cursory way on this topic. This map shows a large landscape, which also has in it very large treatments. The treatments are shown here in the legend. Um, we have, first of all, large grazing exposures, shown here by these, um, these rectangles. And within them, we have plots that are one hectare in size and are separated by a hectare. We've either mowed the plots, shown in, in red, or applied herbicide using glyphosate followed by amazepic in the months um, preceding the planting of sagebrush. Or we use a combination of mowing and seeding. Again, all of this is overlaid in a factorial way onto grazing or no grazing. And then furthermore, we um, have another factor, which is um, we either seeded um, using drill and hand broadcast or not. And you can see here that we've been able to replicate this study in triplicate. And then additionally, um, another replicate was burned. We've also worked on it. Um, so this area that we're trying to establish sagebrush and other species in is notoriously hard for restoration. This is right on the edge of the ecotone between big sagebrush steppe and salt desert. This is in the Birds of Prey National Conservation Area right above the Snake River southern Idaho. The elevation is, is just under 3,000 feet elevation and the precipitation I think is around 8 inches, probably less than a lot of years. And actually in the year of our study it was much less. And so we saw a lot of sagebrush uh, mortality. We outplanted um, these small sagebrush seedlings, which I want to emphasize to you are smaller than the um, spec outplant stock that the BLM normally uses. And the reason we use this small stock is that we wanted to have an intermediate condition between um, what can be learned from seeds and what can be learned from um, larger seedlings that have uh, passed those initial demographic bottlenecks that plants experience when they're within an inch of a harsh soil surface where it's hot and dry. Um, and what this graph shows is uh, from the time we planted out over a year, um, there was very high mortality. We had some initial establishment, but um, there was very dry conditions in the, in the spring of 2013. Um, and dry conditions are part of what we should expect in um, an arid area. Um, arid areas have high year-to-year -year variability in precipitation. It's something that really needs to be considered. We noticed that the, we found statistical support for the idea that the local Idaho seed sources um, were able to have slightly greater um, durability. In other words, they survived a little bit longer, but eventually perished, just like all the other um, seed sources. Some of these other seed sources included tetrapoids. Our local was diploid, 
as was the California and Oregon. These other areas were these other areas were also relatively dry, some were cooler and some were warmer than our local habitat. And all of these subspecies, by the way, were based in big sagebrush. Now, regarding the management treatments, mowing herbs increased survival and feeding the whole community decreased survival. Both of these would indicate that herbs were having a negative effect on the um, the duration of survivorship of these seedlings. This study I, I view as kind of a pilot. It was done only in one year, but it has the scale and scope that we think should be um, emphasized in future research. And we're, we, I would very much like to redo this experiment, replicating in different areas and carrying out over multiple years. Study number two follows up with just one seed source, the local Wyoming big sagebrush, planted into the birds of prey area again. And this experiment was started, spawned off of a discussion I had with Anna Halford. I asked her one day, what, what do you think are the factors that are most affecting your outplants? And she said, well, you know, we've got these, these vast, flat areas that have no structure left in them because the sagebrush is gone, and they are dominated by a homogenous cover of cheatgrass, other annuals, or sometimes um, sandbirch bluegrass. And wind seems to be um, a battering agent that um, knocks these uh, seedling out plants off the landscape. So um, working with her, we devised uh, a large experiment to test how shelter provided either by landscape position, by vegetation, which could be created by the sage, vegetation structure created by the sagebrush themselves, or artificial shelters such as this fence shown here or this wattle might affect the outplants. So the vegetation um, effects were created by either planting the sagebrush in relatively sparse rows of 25 seedlings or clustering those seedlings into grids. Um, in which the seedlings might be able to self-facilitate one another by um, reducing wind speeds. And the overall idea of this is to find ways of creating islands of sagebrush that can be established on the landscape. Once established, that sagebrush can um, create some structure that facilitates the establishment of other desirable species. And um, so this is kind of an interesting test that we, we undertook. The most significant results were related to um, topographic position, like using landscape structure. This graph shows that the survivor, survival of these large um, clubs that were, uh, I think, uh, almost two years old when we all planted them, survival was much higher if we planted them into drainages compared to on slopes and especially on these flat, barren, early cerro landscapes. So this is promising, targeting landscape position, using the Topography for shelter, hydrologic shelter or aerodynamic shelter, um, could be really important. The, sh the artificial shelters also seem to enhance survivorship, but we had a surprising result. Um, we found that after initial establishment, um, those seedlings in the shelters became particularly became prone to herbivory by ants, which is not something that we've seen reported before in the literature, but happened in, in a large way. Each one of these points is a transect of 25 seedlings. You can see we've got thousands of seedlings in this data set. This is very well replicated. N equals 5 for all of those treatments that I've described, by the way. And um, so very interestingly, here we've taken sagebrush seedlings that were um, relatively lush. They were grown under, um, under very fertile conditions at Lucky Peak Nursery. We planted them um, in relatively high densities in some cases. And um, it's not too surprising that um, animals, be they um, vertebrates or in this case, case invertebrates, um, quickly capitalized on this, um, what could be a food source, or who knows, these ants might be um, having predation on the seedlings for other reasons. We've, we've followed up with insecticides to uh, better evaluate this situation. But the point is that we probably need to be paying careful attention to how we're rearing seedlings and different ways that um, the condition of seedlings coming out of nurseries, um, how, how can that affect their success on the landscape? It's more than just about drought adaptation. 
Now, the third study, we're going to shift to seeds. We can learn about seeding factors affecting seeding success by looking back on the grand experiment performed by the BLM in seeding hundreds of um, large areas over the last few decades, um, seeding those areas after they've burned. Um, we did this study uh, specifically with the intent of learning about how seed source might affect the success of, of historic seedings. Along the way, we had to learn about other variables and their, other factors and their influence. It turns out that it's very difficult to get complete information on all the parameters that were chosen by the uh, seeding people for a specific project. And that's something that can affect our ability to have adaptive learning. In this case, we scanned hundreds of historic treatments and found 24 for which we could get good seed information. And those are occurring um, in this map here near Boise. Um, we learned that the seeds generally came from about, on average, 300 miles away and about 2,000 feet higher in elevation, which is kind of surprising um, given that we're seeding relatively warm Wyoming big sagebrush sites in a warming climate. Seeding success um, was affected by a number of, of climate factors, including whether or not sagebrush was present before the fire. And we found that the sagebrush that were covered onto sites was usually a different type than the native type. So again, these are Wyoming big sagebrush sites. We often saw that the sagebrush coming back after seeding was basin big sagebrush or mountain big sagebrush or hybrids between them. And those hybrids um, probably indicate that the seed was coming from central Utah, where you have canyon country and lots of elevation gradients that foster hybridization. Um, these flat plains, like the Snake River Plain, probably don't have as much hybrids on them. So we've done a lot to mix up the, um, the sagebrush types on the landscape. Um, and so we know that the sagebrush coming back on the sites was not um, originating from sagebrush seeds that existed before the fire, we think that the sagebrush before fires um, is leaving good microsites for sagebrush recovery after the fire. Drill seeding was another factor that increased success of um, sagebrush seeds. Kind of interesting. The most interesting outcomes, though, we found um, from doing transects um, two winters ago. Um, we looked at the abundances of sagebrush on sites. And on the left, or I'm sorry, in the low, lower uh, axis here, I'm showing all of the 24 treatments, or just the five treatments that had very uh, that had a good abundance of sagebrush on them. On the right-hand column are all those treatments, 16 that had no sagebrush whatsoever, and we verified that in a number of ways. And then this middle um, set of bars right here are treatments that had any amount of sagebrush. We, the, what are shown here is the difference in climate between the seed source and the seeding site. So values closer to zero mean that the seed source had a climate that was similar to the seeding site. That's what you want to see according to um, most of the paradigms that local seed is better because it's climate adapted. The letters show where we saw a significant um, effect that seed source was, climate of the seed source was different from the seeding site. And what you can notice right off is that there were no effects for differences in precipitation, which surprised us. Instead, temperature, and particularly cold temperatures, chilling degree days below zero Celsius, or the mean temperature of the coldest month, um, were significant predictors of sagebrush success on these historic seedings. Most notably, um, the most successful treatments got their seeds from sites that had just about the same minimum temperature of the coldest month. Conversely, the most unsuccessful sites, seeding projects, got their seeds from sites that were much cooler than the seeding site. So minimum temperatures look to be pretty important. This is a pretty good indication that matching climate is, is very important. Seed zones are probably really key to be, to be considering. 
The importance of minimum temperature, by the way, is corroborated by a number of experiments and physiological studies that we've done. All of them point to the importance of minimum temperatures. And then lastly, I want to note that weather is also very important. There's a lot more, um, we saw that there was a lot more success in colder, wetter years following seeding. And it wasn't the year or two just after seeding. It happened to be that, that cool, wet conditions, um, they were having that their effect about three to four years after fire and seeding, which is really intriguing. And a colleague of ours, David Pilliad, noticed in um, his studies of historic seeding that fires happen to occur in drought years, but drought years tend to persist into the initial seeding. So the emergency stabilization and rehabilitation program usually provides for seeding just in the year after fire and not thereafter, historically. Um, and then by year three, the projects are supposed to be wrapped up, monitored, and final reporting. And what we're finding is that um, the, the establishment is actually delayed, probably because the, um, the drought cycles are ending and favorable weather is returning. This is another indication that we really need to have a longer um, outlook on the uh, perennial reseeding projects. So the last project I'll just give a very quick overview of. I'm almost done. Um, this is a follow-up study where we're expanding the same kind of work I just described out onto the entire um, Great Basin. And we're expanding our objectives a little bit to think a little bit more about how um, the seeding practices, which are designed primarily for site stabilization and protecting sites from damage, um, but they often use native seed. And so we want to know as a site outcome, are they doing something to enhance um, habitat for species like sage grouse? In this sage success study, which is done with David Pilliad and a number of other USGS colleagues, and we're doing this um, in conjunction cooperatively um, with BLM. Um, our approach now is to pick sites randomly to study. When I say sites, I mean historic seedings. Additionally, we are going to those treatments which the BLM has deemed to be successful. So we can ask, what's different about the factors on these sites compared to random sites that make the successes possible? We can identify those factors and focus on them in future restoration efforts. And then secondly, we're using Colin Homer's um, extensive Worldview 2 imagery to identify where patches of sagebrush have come up on the landscape. We want to characterize what's unique about the, the areas that are supporting those patches compared to the surrounding landscape. All of this, again, is designed to help us get an idea on what factors are can be leveraged to improve sagebrush recovery in short order. This map simply shows um, where Collins' worldview imagery is and where some of the historic fires and treatments are on the, on, in the northern Great Basin and central uh, Great Basin ecoregions. So our sampling is very broad. In addition, we're also um, doing detailed measurements on soil properties and doing hydrologic modeling to provide a more resolute understanding of um, climate and weather controls on recovery. OK, I'm, I want to now provide a very quick summary of um, the messages that I've been trying to get across. And I had originally hoped that this slide would uh, unfold its words um, line by line, but uh, we had to switch to a PDF format that doesn't allow this. Um, at the top, um, the, the big opportunity here is now becoming, um, this phrase is becoming um, a, a, a catchy thing that we're seeing in newspapers. Um, we used this to title a seminar series last spring um, that was a lot of fun, really enjoyed the talks in it. The right seed, using the right seed at the right time at the right place. This is the mantra. So we need to make a case that seed sources matter. We need to develop seed sources and we need to develop plant materials. Common garden studies, like I've just shown, and more extensively, are essential for understanding adaptation, like knowing which climate parameters to pay attention to, and getting the information that we need to parameterize seed zone. 
seed zones, their application is not cheap. Um, the harder you have to look to get the right seed and the more you have to um, categorize your seed and limit its distribution potential, well, the more expensive it'll be. How resolute do we need to be? That's the key question. Sagebrush taxonomy is not trivial. This is something that we're working on extensively. It's, it's difficult even for experts to know um, the type of seed sagebrush that they're collecting seed from. And sometimes when you have large mega fires, it's very difficult to know what type of sagebrush was out on the, the landscape. Um, this area needs more work. Once we know what seed we want, we've got to have it available. Um, getting the seeds and finding ways to increase them are important. Most of the seed increase occurring right now is being done on farms for um, some grasses and many forb species. To my knowledge, there's not a lot of sagebrush gardens that are uh, on the landscape right now. But given the rapid loss of sagebrush, maybe we ought to be considering seed increase gardens. Uncertainty in seedbed, and condi seedbed conditions. So um, seeding efforts need to be done as part of multi-year programs and not just a one-year one-off project. This is important considering all the weather variability and how it affects moisture available to seeds and young seedlings. I mentioned how seed soil stability, wind erosion, could be a major factor affecting big sagebrush in particular. We can predict where and when wind erosion is likely to occur, and that can be incorporated into post-fire rehabilitation and sagebrush seeding plants. Integrating weather prediction and planning, a number of tools are um, being developed right now that can help. Notably, for fires like the soda fire that just burned 285,000 acres just west of where I'm talking to you from now here in Boise, um, supposedly an El Nino is on the way. What does that mean for our sagebrush recovery potential? Can we factor that into our plants? That's a question. Test seedling propagation and planting techniques. Um, I touched on this above, but um, I, I mentioned a lot about how nursery conditions do matter. There's major questions about what kind of stock we should be deploying on the landscape. Um, there hasn't been a lot of variability in trials of this, and we haven't learned much, as much as we could be learning on different ages of outplanting, um, different degrees of hardening. Um, we tend to outplant um, what we think are bigger and better seedlings, but these are really harsh landscapes and bigger is not always better in terms of survivorship, especially initial survivorship. Um, I mentioned how there's lots of opportunities to, landscape, to leverage landscape shelter, hydrologic and physical shelter, and use um, cheap, inexpensive wind fences and things like that. Or altering planting designs, using sagebrush and other species as structural stepping stones to facilitate their establishment as well as other desirable species. And then, like I mentioned, sagebrush are never seeded by themselves. So how do treatments of other herbs play out to affect sagebrush in the long run? There's a lot of research still needed on this topic. And then lastly, most important in my mind, allowing for adaptive learning and management. Um, I struggled to get enough information on seed sources from historic seeding to, um, to, to, to learn you know, how, how much seed sources have affected um, sagebrush seedings, and it shouldn't be that way. I, I believe that we should have all the information necessary in order to um, learn from our grand seeding experiments that are done for actual management. Seeding in the Great Basin could be considered one of the greatest conservation experiments that have, has been done in the U.S. Um, so monitoring is essential. It's got to be done in the long term, and uh, all, again, all this documentation is just key. Um, as a final parting comment, I'd like to um, call attention to a new Great Basin fact sheet that's been done on establishing big sagebrush from seedlings, not from seed, but seedlings. Um, this has a lot of useful ideas in it, and there's a wide um, range of experts out there now who've been working hard on this topic beyond myself. Okay, that's all I have, um, and I think I have time for questions. Liz, do you want to take over and moderate? Sure. So if anyone has a question for Matt, you can use the 
um, chat box on your screen that Matt showed kind of at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, we've got one question that's come in so far, Matt, and so I'll go ahead and read this one to you. And that is, will you be looking at some of the mo more recent fires, such as areas burned in 2012? Yes. Actually, um, one of the most exciting, well, the areas burned in 2012, um, we've worked on a little. We've worked more on an, an area burned in 2014, the Preacher Fire. And the reason for that is that um, the Shoshone field office was able to acquire um, something like 10 different seed sources of sagebrush. And the person that flew the seed onto their 30,000 acres used GPS in the plane. Um, and one seed source at a time, he gps exactly where the seed was put in the ground. We had been monitoring wind erosion on that site and on that whole burn area. We were very familiar with what was happening out there. We were able to track the survivorship of the um, sagebrush there. That's an example of how um, some land managers um, in the BLM took the extra effort to get detailed information on the seed sources they were using and where they were applying those seed sources and then made that info available to us as researchers to capitalize on the learning opportunity. Um, we hope to do a lot more work like that. Um, 2012, it's interesting that you, should, that you mentioned 2012 because that was probably the premier opportunity to learn from um, the many fires of different sizes and different configurations and the many different ESR emergency stabilization um, seedings that went on um, then. Unfortunately, um, we, didn't really, we couldn't really come up with the funding necessary to um, chase most of those opportunities down. I am planning to get um, involved with the 2012 soda fire that's almost 30,000 acres and in, part of it's in um, sage grouse habitat and will have um, seedings. It doesn't look like we have any other questions that have come in yet. Oh, right as I say that, we get one more. So here's your next question, Matt, which is, were you able to detect any effect of grazing from the blocked landscape experiment? We weren't. Um, I only reported on the sagebrush survival. And um, our experiment was not very um, it wasn't very strong for testing the grazing effect. And the reason was that um, we weren't able to have the equivalency of um, the types of sagebrush seeded onto the grazed compared to ungrazed area. Um, because that seeding occurred in 2013, which was an exceptionally dry spring, there was actually very poor establishment of of either the seeded or even the background um, species that weren't seeded. And therefore, there wasn't really much to graze in, in the first place. We need to redo that experiment to have a better, uh, more concise test of grazing. I think it would be interesting to do because um, I've learned that grazing, in some cases, has um, indirectly facilitated the establishment of sagebrush, perhaps by removing herbaceous competitors. So a topic that needs more work. All right, we have a few additional questions here for you, Matt. The next one is, um, see, do sagebrush need mycorrhizae uh, for establishment? Sagebrush do have mycorrhizae on them, and several studies have shown positive benefits of mycorrhizae to um, sagebrush, and especially young sagebrush, but not all studies show that. So I, I think the evidence is mixed. Um, the most recent evidence that I've observed was from Bill Davidson here in Boise, who did his master's thesis on that topic, and he did find a number of ways that, that um, sagebrush were enhanced by mycorrhizae. Um, he dipped the roots in, in uh, inoculum um, before outplanting into the birds of prey. Um, so it, I think the evidence is somewhat mixed. Again, that's another topic that we should continue to look at. Um, 
keeping in mind that some outplanting experiments could not identify a strong signal that, that mycorrhizal inoculation um, made a difference. Okay, you've got about five or six more questions that have come in here. The next one is, was it Wyoming sage that you seeded? And if so, will you be trying the same experiment with mountain or basin? Okay, so the, I, I haven't actually, we did do some seeding on the, um, the, the land treatment project that had the big um, hectare plot sizes. And it was Wyoming big sagebrush that was seeded. And, um, and none of those sagebrush seeds germinated as far as we could tell, and we did look pretty, pretty closely. Um, our, the most, most of the sagebrush that we've put on the landscape has been sagebrush plugs, and we've used a mix of Wyoming big sagebrush for one experiment, and then for the other experiment, we, we, used, um, we actually used a blend of Wyoming and basin big sagebrush types, but in the end, only the basin big sagebrush was um, able to be evaluated, like using statistics and things like that. Okay, and we have a question about um, wondering what your thoughts are about using bacteria like D7. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the bacteria um, which could be used to control cheatgrass is something that needs to be investigated a little further. Um, there's some preliminary evidence that it can be effective in some but not all situations. We don't know what those situations are. And I believe we really need to embark on a broadly distributed study that evaluates the effectiveness of the bacteria per se, like separate from herbicides and things like that that tend to be blended with it. And that when I say distributed, I mean distributed throughout the Great Basin in a wide range of climates. Um, climates that um, are winter wet, summer dry, um, and conversely areas that have a little bit more spring and summer precipitation. And I believe that the plots should still be, um, we're not ready for large scale deployments of those bacteria yet because there's still a lot of unanswered questions about um, how the bacteria relate to native um, microbes. And furthermore, um, I, I haven't seen a demonstration project that has evaluated the bacteria separate from many other factors that affect cheatgrass and other exotic annuals. So again, that's another area that needs a little bit more investigation. Okay. And do any of your findings apply to other sage step species, such as bitterbrush? And would it be helpful to co-plant sagebrush and bitterbrush in fire-affected areas? Um, I am, am not very informed on bitterbrush, even though I, I live and, and play around it a lot. Um, I, it seems to me that bitterbrush is capable of, of rapidly, uh, relatively quickly attaining large structure. And I believe that that structure can be important for breaking up the homogeneous um, uh, structuralist condition that's created by um, annual grasses. And so I do, and I believe in general that, um, that cr giving that structure and imparting diversity on the landscape could help foster the establishment of other desirable forbs and, and grasses. So yes, I think that co-planting is, is probably something that should be considered. Um, so bitterbrush can occur across a wide range of climates. Um, I don't know much about its genetics. <coughs> Excuse me. However, other species like um, rabbit brushes, <coughs> rabbit brushes um, can establish readily in disturbed areas, and those also quickly create structure, and rabbit brushes notably are also good for pollinators. Um, but rabbit brushes are less desirable from a livestock perspective, and um, I understand they also have volatiles in them that um, are negative in terms of um, when we consider combustibility. Um, I did do a parallel study, common garden study, on blackbrush, and we learned that blackbrush um, which is also another 
widespread species. That species happens to straddle the divide between the cold desert that sagebrush dominates and the warm desert that creosote dominates. Um, and we learned that local adaptation is very strong in black brush. And in fact, we were able to identify different ecotypes, um, warm adapted and cold adapted ecotypes that were associated with the either the, the cooler, drier Colorado Plateau or the warmer Mojave Desert. And so there's very high genetic diversity that must be taken into account in order to have effective restoration of black brush. Black brush is also affected by invasion of exotic annuals and wildfire. It's also a species that's not very well adapted to fire caused by annual grasses. So there's a lot of parallels um, to, to that species. Um, there's other shrubs like um, three-tip um, sagebrush. Three-tip sagebrush is valuable habitat for wildlife. It's a re-sprouter. Re and so its ecology after fires is going to differ somewhat from the big sagebrushes. This next question is a little bit longer, so give me a second to read through it all. And I think you've touched on a few aspects of it. Um, but has there been any interest in examining transplanting sagebrush? I realize there are many challenges with this, but my experience is there's high rates of survival of transplants. We have mowed, plowed hundreds of thousands of acres of sagebrush. Um, if you're thinking transplant source is an issue and, um, in Idaho and will continue to for the next few years, and they mentioned that's through the Farm Bill program, um, transplants could provide many benefits and seem particularly germane to the issues of structure and recovery. I, I really like that idea a lot. Um, we had great success in transplanting sagebrush onto a several acre experiment on the Idaho National Lab near Ar Arco, Idaho, um, which is a very harsh site for sagebrush. Um, notably, that was a Wyoming big sagebrush site, and we transplanted um, Basin big sagebrush off of Mima Mounds and Wyoming big sagebrush off of the, the drier um, microsites. And in the long run, all of the Wyoming big sagebrush died off, and the site is now dominated by thick stands of basin big sagebrush. Um, so I've, I also have observed that transplanting can be effective. It's probably most effective at relatively small scales. Um, transplanting might help establish islands of sagebrush if you had a very large burn area, you know, in, in a large burn area. But transplanting is probably not going to quickly have an impact on tens of thousands of acres. I believe it should be explored um, further, and it should be one of several tools, several approaches um, using uh, uh, combined um, in our rehabilitation efforts. Um, the, uh, an interesting question, though, is like, where would you take the sagebrush from? Um, who's going to want to give up their sagebrush as it becomes scarcer? For the next question, um, do you know if plugs or bare root outplantings are more successful for Wyoming sagebrush? Um, people like Heidi Newsom and Kent McAdoo or um, Nancy Shaw will know, know the precise answer to that <clears throat> more readily than I do. But my, my sense is, is that plugs are relatively um, um, better. Um, again, that could be verified. There's several publications out that have compared um, those. But g generally speaking, um, the, the specs that are used in southwest Idaho for um, stock usually um, prescribe plugs over bare routine. OK. And the next question here, um, we still, just so you know, Matt, we've got about four more questions that we'll try and get through before the hour's up. Um, okay. How long after imazepic treatment was the sagebrush seeding completed? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I believe it was um, months. So if I, if, um, I'd have to look back on, on our paper. I should know this off the top of my, my tongue, but I don't. Um, I, I believe it was months later. 
Okay. And given the low success rate of these experiments, do you think we can realistically expect to restore the sagebrush steppe over large landscapes? Well, that, yes, I, I, I do think that there are prospects for it. Um, one concern I have is that I, I've heard a sentiment that um, could be summarized as, as let's throw in the towel on dry sites and focus our resources on restoring relatively wet or cooler sites. However, I learned from that um, Boise pilot study that a lot of the failures in seedings were due to the fact that the BLM was not getting the seed that they asked for from the seed and from, from the um, seed suppliers. It's nobody's fault because it's, it's very challenging to do correctly. But our data suggests that the success of seeding those dry lower Snake River Plain sites um, probably would have been considerably better over the last few decades had um, more climate adapted seed and appropriate subspecies been used. So that combined with the fact that um, historic seedings have been one-offs, one-time efforts um, without opportunities for multiple interventions to capitalize on weather variability. Um, I, I believe we really haven't given restoration of dry sites a fair shake. It, it'll be, it's harder and more expensive than wetter sites, but nonetheless it's still important and I, I, I think we should continue to try. I do believe that we can get it right. And the secretarial order um, describes lots of um, policy and approach changes that I think are going to be um, very important for enabling a much better approach to restoring dry sites. So I don't think we should give up just yet. Okay, two more questions. And the next one is, what is the ecological difference in terms of sage-grass habitat between the three subspecies? So Basin Big Sagebrush um, provides structure. It's a fa relatively fast growing, especially the diploid version is relatively fast growing and it can um, provide structure that um, could, could um, help sage grouse avoid predation, but it's considered to be less palatable to sage grouse during the winter. Mountain big sagebrush is considered highly palatable, however mountain big sagebrush is often covered in snow during the winter when sage grouse is most relying on um, on, on foraging on big sagebrush. And so that leaves Wyoming big sagebrush as um, a particularly important, um, uh, particularly important for, the, for sage grouse. Low sagebrushes are also important too, and those, those need to be um, discussed more. Okay, and a question here about um, have you heard how well or not well the seed pillows seem to be working for seeding sagebrush. Um, the seed pillows being the, um, the encapsulation of seeds into um, aggregates that, uh, w with compounds that delay germination to favorable um, time periods. Um, I, I presume that's what the question is referring to. Um, I have not seen a data set that, sh that is specifically on sagebrush seed outcomes in pillows. I've seen more data for um, grasses that are in restoration seedings. Um, that's not to say that the data aren't out there, I just haven't um, evaluated them myself. So I'm naive on okay. that. And Matt, if you have just a minute, we had one last question sneak in here, um, and that is, are there any efforts to collect and store sagebrush seed from various locations and genetic sources um, to create a sage seed bank that would have appropriate seeds for various conditions? Yeah, um, there are efforts to do that. Uh, seeds of Success program, jointly funded by the BLM and uh, the Chicago Botanical Gardens uh, works on that. Um, the problem with sagebrush seed, big sagebrush seed, is it, it's not long-lived. Um, and there's still questions about just how long-lived it is. Um, in the field, we think it's viable only up to three years. Um, we've had some seed 
that's been um, well preserved and chilled and dried um, carefully that's lasted longer, but nonetheless begins to lose some viability. So yes, we should be banking seed and we should be collecting as widely as possible since we don't know where fires are going to occur in a subsequent year. Um, another way to deal with sagebrush seeds is to increase our resources for um, rapid and extensive seed collections once we know where the summer wildfires are. So sagebrush seeds come out and are collectible in like late October, November, early December. By that time we know where the fires are. Unfortunately many of the seed sources get burned up by then. So a combination of approaches, seed banking, um, saving human resources for um, rapid seed rapid and extensive seed collections um, once the fires have occurred. And then um, the last thing I think is probably most important, which is I believe we need to establish more gardens for sagebrush seed increase, considering that sagebrush seeds um, aren't that long lived. I will just point out to everybody that when you exit today's uh, webinar that there will be a really brief a survey that will pop up on your screen. It only takes about two minutes to complete. This information has been really valuable to the Great Basin LCC to help further refine these webinars and um, future activities. So please do take a moment to complete that as you wrap up. And you will see contact information for the Great Basin LCC website. Um, later on this week, you will see our, this broadcast posted on our YouTube site and linked on our website. So. If you missed any part of today's conversation, you'll be able to watch it there. Matt, any final closing thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to thank the audience. Um, this was one of the best question sessions I've ever had. I really appreciate um, the, the thoughtfulness of those questions. They, um, those questions are useful for me, too, because they help me think about how to prioritize um, our research and our future research directions. So thank you all very much.